Welcome to this month's edition of Focus on Health. I'm your host, Dr. Barbara Brookmeyer, and today we'll be talking about public health preparedness. It's all about the plans. And our special guest is Rissa Watkins, a planner with the Frederick County Health Department. Rissa, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So why do you want to talk to everybody about plans? Well, it's really important for us to be able to tell everyone what kinds of plans we have in Frederick County because a lot of people probably aren't aware of them at all. And it's easy for people to think that there aren't any plans if you don't know about them. So we wanted to take the opportunity to let people know what kind of plans we have, what kind of responses we would be doing in a public health emergency so that everyone will know what the health department can do and also so people can start thinking about what they should be doing in an emergency to protect themselves and their families. Mm -hmm. Okay, well let's start with what kinds of plans does your division work on? Well, there are a lot of things that can affect the health of the Frederick County residents. Anything from an infectious disease outbreak like influenza, we've seen that, to extended power outages from storms that can affect your food and water supply, and even some things we don't like to think about like a radiological exposure or a bioterrorist event. So there's a lot of things that we need to think about when we're looking at how to plan for uh, protecting our health and safety. Well, so it sounds like there are, are, well, I guess there's an infinite number of types of situations. Do you have a separate plan for each and every possible type of situation? Well, we thought about having a plan for everything that could happen, but that would make dozens and dozens of plans. And then the problem is there's always something that you didn't think about, and then you might not have a plan for that. So instead of doing different plans for every situation possible, we decided to focus on how we may be responding in different emergencies. So that reduces the number of plans and focuses our attention on just what we would be actually doing. It gives us a bit more flexibility. So for example, we may need to push out medicine to the, pop to the population very quickly. Um, that could be if we need a, a mass vaccination uh, clinic like we had for um, the H1N1 flu pandemic in 2009 and 2010, uh, we used that kind of response. It's the same type of response that we would need to do if we needed to push out a lot of antibiotics. So the response stays the same in a lot of different situations, and that gives us a lot of flexibility in our planning. Mm -hmm. Well, that definitely makes sense that you focus really on what your functions are rather mm -hmm. than the types of scenarios. So can you tell us a little bit more about maybe some of the other responses that you have plans for? Well, we start our planning with uh, an all-hazards emergency operation plan. That's our base plan because in any situation that we have, we may be, um, there are certain things that we would be doing regardless of what we're responding to. So that all-hazards plan has things like contacting staff. You're always going to have to contact staff no matter what you're dealing with. So then based on that um, all-hazards plan, we have a hierarchy of plans to show how our response plans interact with that. And there are different plans based on our responses for things like um, medical countermeasure dispensing and distribution, um, a public health and medical surge, uh, mass fatality planning, risk communication, and continuity of operations. Those are some examples. Okay. Uh, so are there some plans that you have currently in the works? You mentioned some of the ones that you already have. So are there some plans that are under development right now? Yes, we are currently drafting a radiological emergency response plan and also a non-pharmaceutical intervention plan, which is the new fancy way of saying uh, isolation and quarantine. Mm -hmm. So once the plans are developed, are they reviewed by anybody? Yes, they are, but who does the reviewing depends on the plan. So we have some plans that are reviewed by other, um, other divisions in the health department if they would be the main players during that type of response. And then we have other plans that are reviewed by a larger circle, um, some of the other county agencies, because they might be responding um, with us. So it all depends. And uh, for example, we have the medical countermeasure dispensing and distribution plan that's reviewed annually by our county MPAC committee. Okay, and that's our Emergency Management Policy Advisory Committee for the county. That's, that's it. That's what MPAC is. Yep. Um, so then, um, what about... Uh, I forgot. Testing? Evaluating plans? Ah, yes, yes. Yeah, that's that's always, question, once yes. you get them written, you have yes. to figure out how to evaluate them. And um, we have different ways. Some of our plans are evaluated internally as we exercise them and test them. Um, and then there is an extensive evaluation process specifically for our medical countermeasure dispensing and distribution plan. And that evaluation happens every year and it takes several hours or half a day or more. 
And uh, I'm happy to report that in the last two years, we've gotten a 100% on that evaluation. So two years ago, that was done by the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And last year, we were evaluated by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So we're very pleased with those results. And I have to say, it's largely due to the amazing partnerships that we have in this county and all of the agencies that uh, work very well with us. So that's the only way it's possible. Well, great. Well, congratulations on uh, hard work and a good effort there that went into 100%. Can't get better than 100%. Yep. So is that the only way that you know that you've got a good plan? Well, it definitely doesn't hurt to have a, a score like that. Um, so it's nice to have something like that where we know that we've gotten all of the different uh, boxes checked in an evaluation like that. But the other way we test our plans is by exercising them. So we try to do two full-scale exercises every year, testing different parts of our plan. And we really learn a lot when we do that. And there's always things that we change, tools that we update, um, a lot of feedback that we get that we incorporate to constantly improve the plans that we have. Hmm. Well, viewers might be interested in hearing then, so maybe some examples of some of the improvements that you've made after exercising some of the plans. We learned a lot about how to effectively have people line up and get through clinics quickly, during, especially during our H1N1 flu clinics. I'm sure some viewers can remember uh, big clinics, long lines, and we learned a lot about lining and or queuing people um, so that they can go through as quickly and efficiently as possible. So we perfected some of those, uh, those techniques and we've incorporated them into our plans and have used them in other exercises since then. That, so that has worked really well. Um, we also worked on uh, how best to set up and staff and run a call center. Um, we learned a lot about that during the H1N1 season as well. And we were able to share some of our best practices with the Frederick County Sheriff's Office when they set up a call center during the G8 Summit in May of 2012. So it was great to have that opportunity to uh, share what we learned and help others. Yeah, that's great. And uh, so with the plans, if someone wants to read them, is there a place where somebody can go to view the plans? Right now, the Medical Countermeasure Dispensing and Distribution Plan is available on our website at um, frederickcountymd.gov forward slash php and other plans will be added there as they're made available so you can always check back. All right. Well, before we end, is there anything else that you'd like to share with folks? Um, I could just say that, you know, we're really proud of the planning that we've done in the county so far and it's largely, as I said, as a uh, help from other county agencies and we're constantly reviewing and updating them and making them better so that we can make sure that we can do the best we can to protect the health and safety of Frederick County. Um, but the real cornerstone to any of this is personal preparedness. So it's really important to encourage everyone to think about how they can um, be safe and healthy at home, at work, at schools, and different ways that they can um, plan for themselves. So there's a lot of good things on our website and also at the ready.gov website, and we would just encourage everyone to take a look at that. Very good. Well, thank you for sharing some of the emergency preparedness plans that are available in the county, talking a little bit about that, and also remembering to add the part about people being their own best first responder and uh, what they can do uh, first to maybe avoid the need to rely on government services Definitely. in an event. So thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. And now please stay tuned for this month's Medical Myth. So, I got this new family, and I don't know what it is about this one, but she can't seem to put down that toy. Oh, and she even talks to it. Who's she talking to? Her mom? She talks to her mom a lot. And now here's this month's Medical Myths. This month's Medical Myths is about exercise. The first myth is that exercise only benefits the body. Well, many people are unaware that another very important organ, the brain, is also damaged by inactivity. What research shows is that exercise strengthens connections in the brain and lessens the damaging effects of stress and depression. The second myth is that losing weight is the only advantage to exercise. What the research shows is that after a few months of increased exercise, people are healthier because they've reduced risk factors such as blood sugar levels. Even though a person may not be losing weight, his health has improved in ways that might not be measured. Don't give up. 
Another common myth is that there is no time to exercise because one needs to devote an hour or more a day at one time performing exercise to get any benefit. Research shows that even moderate activity is shown to reduce your risk for heart disease and stroke. If you don't have 30 minutes in a day to exercise, try splitting it up into 10-minute segments instead. There are simple things you can do to increase your activity without having to go to the gym. Take the stairs instead of the elevator, do body weight exercises like push-ups or crunches at commercial breaks, or take a short walk after lunch. Remember that any exercise is better than none. A related myth is that exercising is not affordable because one must join a gym. You do not need to join a gym to exercise. You can exercise for free just by walking in your neighborhood, local shopping plaza, or park. The final myth for today is that one can be too old or too weak to exercise. You know, there are some people in their 70s who are still able to run marathons, lead long heights, and keep up with grandchildren. A lot of the symptoms that we associate with older age, such as weakness and loss of balance, are actually symptoms of inactivity, not age. That's this month's Medical Myths. Let's get moving. And now here's Angie Blair with this month's health tip. Hello, this is Angie Blair, health educator with the Frederick County Health Department. This month's health tip is brought to you by the Public Health Preparedness Division. Would you be ready if there were an emergency? This September is the 10th National Preparedness Month sponsored by FEMA. National Preparedness Month encourages Americans to take steps to prepare for emergencies in their homes, businesses, schools, and communities. You can take important preparedness steps, including getting an emergency supply kit, making a family emergency plan, being informed about the different emergencies that may affect you, as well as taking the necessary steps to get trained and become engaged in community preparedness response efforts. If there is a disaster in your community, you might not have access to food, water, or electricity for some time. By taking time now to prepare emergency water supplies, food supplies, and a, dis and a disaster supplies kit, you can provide for your entire family. If you take medications regularly, try and stock up on a three-day supply for emergency use. Many prescription plans, plans now allow for this. Make plans with your family and friends in case you're not together during an emergency. Discuss how you'll contact each other, where you'll meet, and what you'll do in different situations. Ask about planning at your workplace and your child's school or daycare center. Businesses can participate in National Preparedness Month, too. How quickly a company is able to get back to business after a terrorist attack, a tornado, a fire, or a flood often depends on emergency planning and preparation done before the disaster strikes. The Ready Campaign highlights three steps to business disaster preparedness. One, plan to stay in business. Two, talk to your people. And three, protect your investment. These steps underscore how important it is for businesses to document their property and equipment, back up business critical information, and put a response team in place. Being prepared also means staying informed. In Frederick County, you can tune in to WFRE 99.9, Key 103, or WFMD 9.30 a.m. for local news and information, or watch County Channel 19. You can also get your information from our website and by signing up for the county's emergency alert system. For more information about Being Prepared and National Preparedness Month, please see the FEMA website ready.gov. This September, take some time to think about how you can get a kit, make a plan, and be informed. Thank you for tuning in to this month's Health Tip. And thank you for joining us for this month's edition of Focus on Health. Please join us next month.